with some confidence, uh, higher toxicity than for the gold nanoparticles in the previous talk. So, good morning, everybody. In this study, we investigated the toxic and pro-inflammatory effect of two types of copper oxide nanoparticles on human FG2 cells. Firstly, we characterize the physical chemical parameters of both uh, nanoparticles. Uh, based on electronic microscopy observation, we determine that the first type of uh, copper oxide nanoparticles have a road shape with a time nanometer thickness and a length of approximately 70 nanometers. The second one has a, um, a spherical uh, shape with approximately 40 nanometers of in diameter. If you take a look at these two tables, you will see the chemical composition of both nanoparticles. You will see that we detect only copper and oxygen. And you will also uh, observe that the chemical composition is very similar between the two types of nanoparticles. We also characterize the size distribution of both nanoparticles after dilution into the cell culture medium by centrifugal liquid sedimentation. As you can see on this graph, we detect two peaks, one around uh, 400 nanometers corresponding to uh, agglomerated nanoparticles, and the second one around 10 nanometers corresponding to well dispersed nanoparticles. Interestingly, we also observe that the size distribution for both nanoparticles is very similar. Next, we wanted to know whether this nanoparticle could induce a uh, toxic effect on FG2 cells. And we also wanted to know uh, whether release of copper ions could have an impact uh, and could participate to the toxicity of the nanoparticles. So firstly, we measured the release of copper ions from both copper oxide nanoparticles and compare to uh, the copper um, chloride salt. As you can see on this graph, we observe a dose-dependent increase uh, in the release of copper ions from both nanoparticles, but we also observe a higher release of copper ions from uh, road-shaped nanoparticles in comparison with spherical nanoparticles. When we investigated the effect of these nanoparticles on cell viability, we observe a dose-dependent uh, toxic effect of both uh, copper oxide nanoparticles, but interestingly, we also observed at the highest concentration a more cytotoxic effect of road shaped nanoparticles in comparison with the spherical nanoparticles. Concerning the copper uh, chloride salt, we only observed a limited uh, effect, toxic effect of this uh, copper chloride, suggesting that release copper ions. Uh, will um, participate only in part to the cytotoxicity of nanoparticles. We also observe this difference in cytotoxicity between the two nanoparticles using other cell lines like A549 or on the integrity of the in vitro reconstituted intestinal epithelium. As we observe that both nanoparticles could induce cytotoxic effect on FG2 cells, we wanted to uh, know whether this nanoparticle could penetrate into FG2 cells. So we use nanosims, which is a technique uh, allowing simul uh, simultaneous uh, analyze up to five chemical elements. Here we analyze the signal from phosphorus, allowing us to observe the morphology of the cells. The signal from copper in red. And as you can see for both nanoparticles, we were able to detect presence of copper inside cells already after two hours of incubation. Next, we wanted to determine whether this nanoparticle could have a prooxidant effect. So we measured the uh, production of reactive oxygen spaces. As you can see here, we observe a dose-dependent increase of the production of ROS and also a time-dependent increase of production of ROS. No production of errors were observed after two hours of incubation, but we detect an overproduction of these errors 
between four and six hours, so after penetration of copper oxide. When we use antioxidant and acetylcysteine, we were able to drastically reduce the cytotoxic effect of both nanoparticles, suggesting that oxidative stress generated by copper oxide nanoparticles uh, play an important role in their cytotoxicity. Next, we wanted to determine the potential pro-inflammatory effect of these nanoparticles at the transcriptional level using microfluidic cards. As you can observe here, we detect overexpression of several uh, mRNA coding for uh, protein implicated both in human immune and inflammatory response. For instance, overexpression of M oxygen as one, confirming the prooxidant effect of nanoparticles, and also interleukin-8. We confirm this result at the uh, protein level. For instance, M oxygen as one, we observe a higher amount of this protein after four hours of incubation until 24 hours of incubation. And interestingly, we also observe higher amount of M oxygen as one after exposure to road shape uh, nanoparticles in comparison with the spherical nanoparticles. Concerning interleukin-8, we observe a dose-dependent increase of interleukin-8 and also a time-dependent increase of the production of this interleukin-8. Again, we also observe a higher release of interleukin-8 after exposure to road-shaped nanoparticles in comparison with surgical nanoparticles. When we use the antioxidant and acetylcysteine, we were able to reduce drastically the production of the interleukin-8, suggesting that the oxidative stress um, generated by copper oxide nanoparticles could modulate in part the expression of some genes like interleukin-8 implicated in the inflammatory response. As we observe that copper oxide nanoparticles uh, induce oxidative stress, we wanted to know whether a redox sensitive transcription factor could be activated like NRF2, NF-kappa B, and AP1. So we determine the uh, effect of exposure to copper oxide nanoparticle on the activation of this transcription factor by measuring the DNA binding activity. As you can see here for NRF2, we observe an activation of this transcription factor between four and 24 hours. This activation was confirmed by immunofluorescence following the nuclear translocation of this transcription factor after exposure to road-shaped nanoparticles and spherical nanoparticles. Concerning NF-kappa B and uh, AP1, we observe uh, activation of both transcription factors between four and six hours for both nanoparticles, suggesting uh, transient activation of these two transcription, act, uh, transcription uh, factors. Next, we wanted to determine the role played by this transcription factor in the cell's response to copper oxide uh, nanoparticles, and uh, particularly in the expression of M oxygen as one and interleukin-8. So using specific sCRNA, we observed that when we, we reduce the expression of NRF2, we were able to reduce the expression of M oxygen as one, confirming previous data uh, describing uh, M oxygen as one as the target genes of NRF2. We also observe a reduction of the production of interleukin-8 after inhibition of NRF2. Concerning NF-kappa B and AP1, no effect on the expression of M oxygen as one was observed after inhibition of NF-kappa B or AP1, but we observe a slight reduction of the production of interleukin uh, eight after inhibition of both transcription factor. So um, uh, NRF2, NF-kappa B, and AP1 uh, seems to work together to uh, modulate the expression of uh, some genes like interleukin-8. We also wanted to determine whether uh, MAP kinase could be activated after exposure to both nanoparticles. So using Western blotting, we detect the, phosphor the phosphorylated form of the three MAP kinase, P38, R kinase, and uh, June kinase. And as you can see here, already after two hours of incubation, 
we could detect uh, phosphorylation of the three types of um, MAP kinase. Interestingly, we also observe a higher amounts of the three types of MAP kinase after road shape exposure in comparison with spherical nanoparticles. Next, we wanted to determine uh, whether this MAP kinase could modulate the activation of the three transcription factors. So using chemical inhibitor, you can observe that none of these inhibitors were able to reduce the activation of NRF2. However, for uh, NF-kappa-B, we observe that the ERK inhibitor and the June uh, inhibitor reduce slightly the activation of NF-kappa-B, and same results were obtained for AP1. We confirmed this result for AP1 following the uh, phosphorylated form of Sejun, one of the components of AP1, and you can, you can see that using ERK inhibitor or June inhibitor, we were able to decrease the amount of phosphorylated form of Sejun. In order to determine by which me mechanism uh, NRF2 could be uh, activated after exposure to copper oxide nanoparticles, we use antioxidant and acetylcysteine. And as you can see here by immunofluorescence, uh, the presence of n system reduces the nuclear translocation uh, of NRF2. So, in conclusion, we observe that copper oxide nanoparticles could penetrate into FJ2 cells, induce production of reactive oxygen species, participating to their cytotoxicity. This oxidative stress leads to the activation of NRF2 which induce an antioxidant response via, for instance, overproduction of m oxygen as one. MAP kinase were activated, leading to activation of NF-kappa-B and AP1, which could work together with NRF2 to induce expression of some genes, like interleukin-8, leading to an inflammatory response. We also observe different cytotoxic effects between the two nanoparticles. How can we explain these differences? Firstly, based on a different chemical composition. However, our results have shown similar chemical composition between the two nanoparticles. It could be explained by a different size. And indeed, real nanoparticles have different size, but upon uh, dilution in culture medium, we observe that the size distribution between the two nanoparticles is very similar, suggesting that uh, what the cell see when they have been exposed to these two types of nanoparticles is uh, very similar nanoparticles in terms of size distribution as agglomerate or isolated nanoparticles. We could also explain this different cytotoxic effect based on a different specific surface area. And indeed, we observe a higher specific surface area for road-shaped nanoparticles, which are the more cytotoxic nanoparticles. So in order to determine if this different cytotoxic effect could be explained by a different specific surface area, we express the cell viability, the effect of the nanoparticle on cell viability uh, versus nanoparticle exposed surface area, calculating by multiplying specific surface area by nanoparticle doses. And if this different cytotoxic effect could be mainly explained by a different specific surface area, we should not observe any difference between the two nanoparticles on this graph. In other words, for a given um, nanoparticle exposed surface, we should observe a similar uh, toxic effect, which is not the case here. So it suggests that other parameters could be implicated to explain this different cytotoxic effect, like, for instance, release of copper ions. Indeed, we observe uh, release of copper ions from both nanoparticles in culture medium. And it has to be noticed that release of copper ions in, uh, in uh, cell culture medium could lead to uh, extracellular uh, activation of oxidative, oxidative stress with potential deleterious effect. However, when we compare the effect of both nanoparticles to the effect of the copper chloride uh, salt, we always observe uh, a higher cytotoxic effect of copper nanoparticles, suggesting that the release uh, copper ion only participates in part to their toxicity. However, we cannot exclude a transient um, 
eff uh, effect. Indeed, after internalization, nanoparticles could release intracellularly the copper ions, leading to activation of reactive oxygen species production. And as we observe a higher uh, secretion, uh, release sorry, of uh, copper ions from roadshed nanoparticles in comparison with spherical nanoparticles, this difference in release could explain in part this different cytotoxic effect. Finally, we also observe different form between the two nanoparticles. One have, uh, has a um, road shape, and uh, according to uh, literature, more and more evidences have shown that road shaped nanoparticles could induce more cytotoxic effect and penetrate more easily into cells. So we cannot exclude that road shaped nanoparticles in OCD. Uh, could have uh, could uh, enter uh, in greater amount and or uh, with faster internalization rate in cells, inducing more rapid um, cell response in comparison with spherical nanoparticles. So I would like to thank all my colleagues from the University of Namur in Belgium, and of course, of course you for your attention. Thank you very much. Questions to this presentation? Rafi, please. Thank you. Rafi Kornstein from Tel Aviv University. Thank you for your presentation. My question is, first of all, it would be beneficial from the point of view of uh, presentation to uh, normalize the release to the, to the area. So then you could really determine whether it's the release kinetics or dissolution, it's really some changes in the crystallinity or, or some other effect due to the shape of the two particles. And then you could uh, really uh, try and differentiate whether it's really uh, uh, kinetics of release or uh, what you suggest that is uh, uh, not size but size and shape dependent different penetration of nanoparticles into the cell combined naturally with the differential release rates. In fact, we, um, we tried in this conclusion to um, determine by which mechanism, uh, by which mechanism could uh, explain the different cytotoxic effect between the two nanoparticles. And uh, as you observe, we, um, we think that um, probably um, uh, both shape and release of copper ion could be implicated in their toxic effect. Yes, another question over there. <coughs> Why over there? Sergio Gustavo, UCD. Um, I have two quick questions for you. Um, the first one is regarding the dispersion of your particles. So you see basically two main populations, one in the nano size range and one which is big agglomerates. So would you have an idea if the two population of particles contribute in a different way to the mechanism of toxicity that you see due to the huge difference in size? Um, and the second question would be um, regarding your activation of MAP kinases. So it is pretty clear you have uh, P38 and junk, which are stress activated kinases, and that's all makes sense. But how do you explain the activation of ERC? Uh, concerning the first uh, answer, it's a, of course a good question. Um, currently, we do not know uh, which is the uh, real part of uh, contribution between well-dispersed nanoparticles or agglomerated nanoparticles. We did not uh, um, exposure of FG2 cells to um, centrifugated, for instance, um, culture medium after uh, containing nanoparticles to um, distinguish the effect of either uh, well-dispersed nanoparticles or um, 
well-known uh, agglomerated nanoparticles. And concerning your second question, you wonder, you want to know um, why we observe ERC uh, activation. Um, we do not know, uh, know um, by which mechanism these uh, different map kinases could be activated. We only uh, observe activation of the three uh, types of map kinase, but, but uh, currently we don't have any information about the upstream mechanism leading to the activation of this map kinase. an observation. Okay, so we are, we are a little bit behind time, so I would like to close this part of the session for now. Thank our speaker again. <laughs>